Give Can't it up wait. for Vincent Riemer and Bruce Lane. All right. So hello, my name is Vincent Riemer. I'm a software engineer at Symantec. And while during the day I'm doing mostly Java, Spring, uh, free marker templating, uh, on nights and weekends I'm all front end, React. Um, is that up there? How do I get rid of that? Oh my God. We're back, sorry about that. Okay. So, I wanna talk about, because one of my biggest hobbies uh, of all time is electronic music. I wanna talk about a little piece of history of electronic music uh, called uh, the TR-808. Um, now this was, a legendary drum machine. Um, it was produced by the Roland Corporation in 1980 and then subsequently discontinued in 1983. And despite that short lifespan, uh, you can hear it in so many popular tracks out there from uh, Donna Summer's I Need Someone to Dance um, to, <laughs> did I get that wrong? I think so. Um, but you have Africana, um, the whole Planet Rock, and even most recently Kanye West and his 808s and Heartbreak album, where each of each songs on the album featured the drum machine. And it was about eight months ago I decided to work on a little side project uh, for release on August 8th which some may also know as 808 day, called the IO 808. So this is a web app that was built um, completely with React, Redux, and the Web Audio API. Uh, it's widely considered now to be the most accurate recreation of this drum machine, at least on the web. Um, and not only that, the UI is not only exactly the same. I actually took the time to try to synthesize each of the sounds uh, using the Web Audio API. There are no samples that it uses, um, but it still sounds pretty close. Real 808 owners would disagree, though. Um, and I'd like to talk about building something like this, uh, sequencing audio um, in the web, which is a little more difficult than it may seem originally. So. We're gonna build a simple drum machine. It'd be a little hard to go through and go through all, was three, 4,000 lines of code that that one took, but we can break it down. So this is kind of what we're gonna be building. Pretty simple. We can start and stop the sequencer. There's gonna be four steps in a pattern. And if a pattern is active, it'll play a sound. And if it isn't, it won't play a sound. So, we can start right into the code. We got our little class uh, component. And I always like to start with state with these sorts of uh, applications. So what do we need to keep track of throughout it, the application's life cycle? So we need to keep track of the pattern. Um, we need to keep track of where we are in the pattern at any one time. And we need to know if the sequencer is playing or not. And that should look something like this. We have our steps, um, which is an array of integers. I'm just using zeros and ones because it's a lot shorter to write than true and false four times. Uh, we have the current step and playing, fairly straightforward. Now, for rendering, again, also, if we're all React devs here, this should be pretty simple and straightforward. Um, we have the step display, just using an ES6 uh, template. And for the play button, we are just using standard strings. <laughs> um, but it's important to see that we have this handle play press function, which is gonna be sort of the crucial, uh, this is what's gonna start the clock and stop the clock. 
And before I get into that actual implementation, I want to give a brief overview about audio timing on the web or why set interval isn't quite enough. So for timing options, when it comes to things like sequencers on the web, um, we have, you know, good old set interval uh, and we have the audio context. And this is kind of where the web audio API lives and we can get some timing information from it and we can use it to schedule events in the audio. Now set interval is fairly inaccurate. It's generally not considered the best way to get accurate timing. And a big reason for that is that it gets locked up by other JavaScript on the main thread. Now audio context is extremely accurate provided that you are scheduling things. Um, mainly because it only runs on its own dedicated audio thread. You would think that if the web audio API provides you a method of timing, that it would be the best solution for timing audio. Um, the one concern is we can really only, with true accuracy, schedule things ahead of time. Uh, you can't just say, I want something now just doesn't work like that. Um, now, as an example, we have this sort of timeline and these audio events are sort of what we want in this audio event. So like on, off, on, off, on, off. Now, if we were just rendering out those or just scheduling those five events, we could just call a single function which would schedule all five of those events. And that would work fine if all you wanted to do was schedule five events and stop. But in the case of the sequencer, we want a loop. So that brings in a sort of concern because unless we decide to schedule like 999 bars into the future, uh, we can't get this to loop without any extra help. And you can't change anything once you've scheduled it. It's sort of immutable, it's run and you don't control it anymore. Uh, so what we can do, and the reason why I brought up set interval, is that we could split up the uh, set interval function calls and have their intervals be shorter than the scheduling window, or at least how far ahead, so that there's overlap between each of the scheduling calls. And while this seems pretty confusing, maybe, um, especially in the implementation details. I don't have time for that. Um, we have a great article written by Brian Wilson called The Tale of Two Clocks. Um, this is where I got a lot of my information about this topic. And even better is there exists a library on NPM that we can just install that does all of this for us and gives us a nice API for scheduling audio in the web. So now that we know this, we can go back to our code. Now, before we get into this handle play press uh, function, we need, to, we need to store and initialize the audio context and the clock. And we'll just do that in the componented mount. Fairly straightforward. Um, next, we can finally move on to the handle play press. Uh, we're just going to use the playing state to sort of determine whether we're stopping or starting the sequencer. For starting the clock, um, we first update the state to be sort of the initial values at the beginning of the sequence. We start the clock, and then we execute our sort of handle tick callback immediately. Um, and then finally, we repeat that, that callback at a regular interval. And it's in seconds, so this would be 470 milliseconds, which gives us approximately 128 beats per minute. Now stopping is even simpler. Um, we just set the playing to false, stop the clock, clean up the tick event. That's basically it. Now for the tick uh, callback itself, um, one of the most important parts about it is as a function, it is provided in the arguments uh, an event and probably the most important property of that 
event object is the deadline. Now this is the absolute time that we schedule against in audio. So we'll say that's kind of when any sort of event you want to start is gonna start at the deadline. Because this callback function is gonna be called before, sometime before the actual audio event is going to be heard. So we then, using this deadline, take the determine in the steps array, step state, if this is active or not. And then if it is, we trigger the sound using this trigger sound function that we haven't implemented yet, but we'll get to it. Um, passing in the audio context and the deadline. Um, and then finally, we just update the state to get our latest um, step counter working. So to move on to this trigger sound thing, we need to talk about some basic bass drum synthesis. We're gonna do a extremely simple little bass drum. Um, now we have, we start, this is sort of a flow diagram of what our uh, bass drum is gonna look like, at least with the routing of audio. Um, the oscillator is going to route into the amplifier, which is gonna route out to our speakers. Um, the oscillator is gonna be, have its pitch modulated and the amplifier is going to have its gain modulated. Now, this is a sort of standard oscillator right here. It's free running and it should theoretically run forever. Uh, does sound not work? Oh, I... Sorry. There we go. So, there should be sound there. <laughs> but anyway, we're creating the oscillator. This is what that code looks like. Um, setting the frequency to 200 hertz initially. And you can see we're using that, um, that deadline to tell it when it should actually start. Now, we take that sine wave and we pitch modulate it. And this line represents that modulation. And that's what that looks like. The linear ramp to value at time, we're gonna see that a fair amount in other modulations. So the amplifier, this is just basically a volume knob going up and down. Um, and what we're gonna do initially is initialize it at zero so that it, was, it would let no audio through from that oscillator. And then we move it up extremely quickly and then down at a slower rate to kind of give it that kick tail uh, or that stuff that gets people moving. Oh, there it is. And so that's what that would look like, that sort of two-stage uh, envelope. And then finally, we need to send it to the speakers. Uh, the context provides this destination property, which sort of represents any, any specified audio device that you have configured. And then for cleanup, I just set a set timeout for way too long and then disconnect the amplifier from everything. This sort of just lets the, um, the garbage collector know that, oh, we're not using this anymore and we don't care about it, so just throw it away at your convenience. And it should end up looking like this. And we'll see um, if we move into the steps in the state. Oh. But I know what you're wondering. How does, do we get from that simple, simple drum machine with one button to that vast, like, so almost borderline monstrosity number of knobs uh, that is 
the 808. And really, the few things I want to go over with that are some of them are technology changes like this. We use the React internal state uh, in our little exercise there. But when you start to expand, and this is going to be mostly about scale, most of these decisions are mostly about scale. Uh, Redux does make it uh, easier to manage large amounts of that same sort of step data. Um, another important piece that really contributed to um, helping with scaling that step store uh, was seamless immutable. Mainly a choice. I know the big kid in town is immutable JS, um, but seamless immutable is a smaller size and doesn't do all the fancy things that immutable JS does, but I didn't need them. So seamless immutable it was. And then finally, there's a lot of derived data in an application that big. And one way to really help manage that and keep it as performant as possible is a library like reselect. Now, to give you an idea of how big the store gets, you saw we made a, was it four steps for, the, uh, for that sequence or pattern? Well, in the 808, we have 16 steps per pattern. And there are 16 patterns that can be stored. And there are two parts to each pattern so that they can go back and forth. And there can be two variations of each of those parts. And there are also 12 instruments that we also all separately need to keep track of, which, drum roll, no pun intended, um, that's about 12,288 total steps to keep track of in the Redux store. Um, yeah, that's why a lot of getting those sorts of tools that really just help out uh, managing this sort of scale. And it, it runs great. And there was no overt optimization done. It just sort of ended up working with all these amazing tools that we have in the JavaScript world. And it really, when we look at NPM and all the sort of complaints with our ecosystem, like, oh, it's too rowdy or there's too much. I, I disagree because it is all of these tools that let us treat these complex problems as if they were simple problems. Thank you. Can you pass it to me? Yeah? Um, I belong. Okay. Yeah, is it working? Yeah, apparently, yes. Okay. Hello, I'm Bruce Lane. I'm a VJ and a coder. Actually, I do my own VJ software in C++. <laughs> So let's get into some JavaScript today. So I'm going to talk to you about the WebGL uh, part of uh, the JavaScript uh, world, which is, which is um, actually a way you, you get a canvas and you get uh, to draw uh, 2D or 3D worlds. So the, um, actually to do that, we create some fragment shaders, which has a, a C style uh, syntax, or a bit like JavaScript also. And they run on the, the GPU, so you get the maximum performance. So I'm going to sh show you some uh, shader, fragment shader, examples. So, 
um, the uniform variables are uh, variables that come from the CPU and which are used to control the visuals. Like here, we, we've got the resolution of the canvas, which could be uh, like this. Then you can have also a, a variable called uh, uh, high global time, which is uh, the time since the start of the, the canvas uh, rendering. You got the main entry point for your program, which uh, takes um, a vector two as uh, an input, and it outputs uh, a color, which is uh, RGBA and alpha. So we start to normalize the drawing area to get values from zero to one. So actually, in the bottom left, you've got zero, zero. And on the uh, top, top right, you get uh, one, one. OK. And then you, you get the, the color, which is output to the screen, like this, uh, which makes a, a gradient, because I, I did some uh, calculation on the, the values here. I don't know if you understand, it was quite uh, complex for me uh, at first, but you get this kind of result that you can uh, see on shadotoy.com. There are plenty of examples. And that's the starting one. So now you know OpenGL, maybe. <laughs> so I'm continuing with a, a, a circle. Actually, I want to uh, put the, the circle in the, the center, so I just do a simple uh, translation of the coordinates by uh, doing a minus open five. So the center is here now. And to do a circle, you just uh, calculate the length, uh, which is the distance between the center and uh, the borders. So that's an example. And um, I just put the circle as a uh, float in the red and the green values. So that makes uh, this kind of result. OK. Yeah, you know better OpenGL <laughs> now. So that's my uh, open source project for VJ. And these slides were made with a formidable uh, spe spectacle, which is really great. OK, so now I'm going to switch to a um, live coding session so you can see how it can look. Okay.
Thank, Thank you. you.